Good evening, everyone. I'm really glad to see you here, and I'm glad to know that there are people watching us uh, through the streaming uh, of, of tonight's talk. Uh, my name is Scott Pike, and uh, I am the newly elected president of the Salem Society of the AIA. Uh, no, it's actually my honor today to welcome tonight's speaker. Uh, Justin Holcomb uh, and I have never actually worked side by side, but I feel like we've danced around each other and have been in close contact and, uh, for several years now. Uh, Justin received his PhD from Boston University, uh, which is a phenomenal institution, but I think it's the masters that we should really focus on because he got, has his masters in applied anthropology just down the road at Oregon State University. Uh, and then his BA in anthropology from Texas A&M. All right, so we have some fans. Uh, Justin also had a pre-doctoral fellowship at, uh, for two years at the Wiener Laboratory of Archaeological Science at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, which is quite a title, uh, where he spent two years, and I think a bulk of the research that we're going to see tonight was, during, uh, was collected during that time when he was in, based in Athens, but working out of Crete and some of the other, uh, and some of the Cycladic Islands. Uh, currently, Justin is a postdoctoral researcher with the Kansas Geological Survey, which is housed at Can uh, the University of Kansas. And uh, he is doing some very interesting work looking at soils and stratigraphy, uh, w uh, working uh, under Rolf Mendel, who is also another geoarchaeologist. Uh, so if, if uh, Justin is, is, has a, a great career so far, and it's very promising where he's going, and I'm really excited to hear his talk tonight. So please welcome Justin. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Scott. I appreciate it. And uh, I want to say thanks to uh, the Rumpakis family and the Department of Classical Studies here at Willamette. Um, as well as the Ancient Studies and Archaeology program, or the Center for Ancient Studies and Archaeology, um, but also to the AIA um, Salem chapter. Thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate it, and, and everyone else, and, and those of you joining us live tonight. Um, I'm very excited to talk about two of my very favorite topics, geoarchaeology and the earliest occupation of the Greek islands. Now, for me, uh, the story of this topic began in 2010, when I was an undergraduate excavating um, with Texas A&M University and the Center for Study of First Americans. And when I was excavating, I heard of a, a, a big discovery that had happened. In 2010, um, doctors Tom Strasser of Providence College and Curtis Runnels of Boston University discovered a series of stone tools on the island of Crete. And specifically, what they found were some um, stone tools made of quartz that they thought were Acheulean that dated to at least 100,000 years old. Now, this discovery was um, quite um, exciting, but also controversial, and uh, mainly for two reasons. The first is that you may or may not know, but Crete has always been an island. For the last 5.5 million years, it's been an island. And so any discovery on Crete suggests some form of open water travel, OK? The second one is that the traditional narrative in the Aegean Islands is that it's quite young, okay? The earliest occupation, um, maybe the traditional idea is maybe around, say, 12,000 years ago. And this is largely because um, we knew that early foragers had made it to Milos due to the discovery of obsidian at the bottom of, um, well, in Frankti Cave, which is on mainland Greece. And so they must have been able to go to Milos to get obsidian, right? And so, if true, this find on Crete, it had big implications. First, as I mentioned, it would be really early, if not some of the earliest evidence for open water travel or what some could call sea going or sea faring, depending on how you want to define it. Um, and therefore, it might uh, suggest we might have a more complex evolution of human cognition because we have to, or early foragers would have to, um, make the decision to not simply say um, um, we're going to go from here to this wall, but we want to cross open water and, and then make the watercraft or some form of 
of craft to get to that island, right? And so therefore, it might mean a faster rate of cultural evolution as well. But certainly, it meant that it was you know, at least 80,000 years older than anything that had been found in the Greek islands, and therefore the earliest human presence of humans in the Greek islands, and therefore a new route of human dispersal or some other species. And so you can see why archaeologists were quite both skeptical of this find, but also excited. And so for me, when I was excavating, all of these big questions were being debated about. And, um, and so ultimately, it all boiled down to one single question that needed to be solved. And that is, is there an Aegean Paleolithic? And this is essentially what the debate has for the last decade kind of revolved around, right? Now, before I get into the archaeological evidence for how this debate arose, arose I would um, say that I'm aware that many of you are not Paleolithic archaeologists in the crowd. So um, I thought what I would do is provide you, or at least Ortwin, with some archaeological you know, background on Paleolithic archaeology, but um, mainly so that you're ready to um, evaluate for yourself the evidence as I present it, okay? Now, anytime I begin to talk about Paleolithic, Paleolithic archaeology, I like to start it by discussing what's called the sapient paradox. Now, one of the deals with being a Paleolithic archaeologist is that you have to grapple with deep time, millions of years. And so um, by doing this, uh, Colin Renfrew um, had begun to think about deep time and in particular biological and cultural evolution. Um, and by doing this, what arose was something called the sapient paradox that is a, a, a big debate in, in Paleolithic archaeology and paleoanthropology. And it goes like this. Ultimately, if you look at the last, say, two million years, and you consider um, biological and cultural evolution as a ratio, right? For the most part, in the last few million years, it has been a ratio that is heavier on the biological change and lower on the cultural change. Very small changes in cultural evolution and technology and tool typology, but quite um, rapid change in biological evolution. For example, um, now we know that around 200,000 years ago, 250,000 years ago, there were at least five but perhaps seven different species of Homo sapiens on Earth at the same time. Now we have one. And so what archaeologists, and so the, when you look at that ratio of biological to cultural change, and then you consider cult, um, cultural change and how that's changed over the last two million years, um, we know that it's the reverse to biological evolution, right? It's largely slow, but then it ramps up when we get to the Holocene and into, you know, where we have a new iPhone every year. And so this paradox between the, when this kind of ratio flipped from one heavy on bio to cultural is ar what archaeologists argue when that flip happened could be when and not only what it means to be human. Because when the cultural evolution, the script, the ratio flipped, and we start to behave in more complex ways, like cave art and complex stone tools, maybe that's when we started to think more like we do today. So you can see that it's, a, it's, it's quite a big topic. And I'm going to bring that up because it, it makes the find on Crete crucial to unraveling these complex narratives of our biocultural evolution. And so when we find sites like Crete, we need to find more. These are, these are big data points. All right. Now, through that understanding, I'm going to go over not the biological aspect, but the cultural aspect, just to give you an idea of what I mean when I say that the cultural evolutionary change over the last two million years was largely slow. OK, first, and I'll make this brief, but let me say before I get into it that the dates that I'm going to present um, aren't, they're not hard and fast, all right? There's not strict lines between these, and you should think of them more of a, as a gradient, all right? And, that ch and the dates do change by different regions. You know, if I say Lower Paleolithic is 1.8 to 250, 1.8 million, 250,000 years ago, it's, it's usually going to be older in Africa than it is in Europe, okay? Um, so I just wanted to point that out there. But if you have this down, what I'm about to tell you, you're off to a good start about understanding Paleolithic archaeology. Okay, so in the beginning, the oldest stone tools that we have are technically 3.3 million years ago, but in general, that's a, a single site. Uh, we're looking at simple core 
and flake technology, these choppers is what they're called. In Africa, they're called Oldowan, and that's the one at the very bottom there. And um, this, you know, kind of stuck around from about 1.4 to around 1.3 million years ago. And then we see this massive kind of revolution when we start to see hand axes, what's called the early um, Acheulean, okay? There are these crude hand axes on the left there. And these are multi-purpose tools. You can pretty much do anything with them. You can uh, crush bone, you can cut, you can saw. Um, and that was a big change. And you see them all up into Europe and into Asia. And around 600,000 years ago and after 600,000 years ago, these hand axes become more um, shaped, they're more symmetrical, they're better quality, and that's um, called the late Acheulean. And if, as you can imagine, that, that's, there's a few other things like scrapers and um, you know, uh, massive uh, chopping tools that are really associated with the Lower Paleolithic, but you can see that from 1.4 to say 300,000 years ago, that's pretty much what dominates the archaeological record. Now certainly I should say that preservation issues are obviously a thing. We have a lot of the osseous and, and organic materials that just don't preserve. Um, but for the most part, their main stone tool implements are, they look like this. And then what happens around 250,000 years ago, we see another kind of cultural revolution. We see this change in not only the way things are made, but what they look like. Um, and we see what's called prepared core technology, all right? So the brain is shifted to simply making these chopping tools to preferentially thinking about how to break a specific stone tool in certain ways to get a, what's called a preferential flake so that that can be a tool, right? It goes from just taking a cobble and making a tool to now making a cobble and making multiple tools. And that was a, that was a big deal. And it's very um, clear. And also we have hafted implements at this time. Neanderthals are using hafted implements. And I bring up the prepared core technology because this is gonna become a familiar thing that you'll see. What they're doing is taking the cobble and they're striking it in a certain way so that they can get a preferential flake. And you see those telltale times, uh, signs of essentially playing chess with a rock, right? They're making decisions for the future, not just hitting it. All right, and this, this occurs from you know, around 250,000 to 45,000 years ago. Before we see another massive change in the upper Paleolithic, and we start to see the development of blade technology um, and a wide diversity of different projectile points and um, bifacial technology. And the, the blade technology is another big shift in this kind of way to think about stone tool making is chess, where, and on top of that, they're kind of, it's very conservative. They take a cobble and they're taking flakes down the edge systematically and you can get way more off of a single um, tool. But the general story here is you're getting more complexity over time and it's getting shorter, right? Rapid, quicker, quicker change until you get to the Mesolithic or Epipaleolithic, depending on where you are, Mesolithic in, you know, uh, in, in Europe and Epipaleolithic in more like the Near East. And again, these ages change, range, but um, you get what's called microlith trad traditions. It's extremely conservative. Um, and they're called microliths because the stone tools can fit on your fingertip. And that's because they're putting them in bone rods and wood rods and making these complex hafted implements. They're highly mobile foragers, extremely efficient hunters. And these are the humans that we traditionally associate with the Aegean and have for you know, the last few decades. And so one of the other reasons I wanted to give you kind of this rundown, other than preparing you for this brief review I'm gonna give you, is to tell you that these kind of, we use these telltale signs, these clear markers of technological change, even though they're broad chronologically, to find ourselves in time when we, have the, uh, we don't have the ability to date things, right? If we find these on the surface, we can say, wow, look, there's an Acheulean hand axe. And that's how we start making maps like this for, home and for human dispersals. And I'm not going to go over the, the various movements of peoples, but you should know that there's multiple out of Africa events of different species, um, Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Erectus. What I really want to say, other than that we use stone tools to create maps like these, like that data point on Crete would allow us to draw an arrow there, but you'll notice there is no arrow there, right? Going through Greece. And that's because of this traditional narrative I mentioned, which not only puts Greece as late, the Greek islands as late 13,000 years ago, but in reality, Greece has been kind of considered as irrelevant by a lot of archeologists in the broader uh, narratives of human evolution. 
especially the Greek islands, even though recently we know that it, um, the mainland Greece is at least 500,000 year, years um, old, or has sites that are 500,000 years old. And on Anatolia, they're at least a million years old. And I know the text is small, but basically all these sites are one to two million year old sites. And you can see they're all around Europe coming out of Africa. And so the idea has been that the Greek islands are a cul-de-sac. They're inhospitable islands is a quote that you can see. And um, in general, that it has just, you know, really focused on terrestrial routes out of Africa. Water is a barrier, so the idea goes. But this kind of narrative has been pushed uh, back. We've pushed back on this narrative in the last, say, 15 years. And it's, it's really begun with um, claims for an Aegean Mesolithic. And as I mentioned, these claims for an Aegean me Mesolithic are, are pointing to a highly mobile, very uh, open water crossing, definitely seafaring groups of peoples that are coming in through the Greek islands. And these, what you'll see is I'll have a series of maps like this. And the red dots are, are sites, and the black here, I just, I just mainly put the islands rather than all the sites. But these are the islands where we know we have good presence of Mesolithic. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Frankie Cave, we know there's uh, Melian Obsidian that demonstrates that uh, Mesolithic foragers visited Milos. And so this isn't necessarily a problem. Um, it's, not a huge, it's not hugely controversial that we have Mesolithic in the islands. Although there, we do need to find Mesolithic sites because only one of them so far is dated. And so, you know, this is a big research push right here to understand the Mesolithic. When the controversy comes in and when people really start to debate is when we get claims for an Aegean Paleolithic. This is the current, at least, uh, you know, generally pretty um, current um, map of where claims have been found for the Aegean Paleolithic, whether it's Upper Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic, or Lower Paleolithic. All right, and I'm going to go over, I can't go over all of them, we'd be here for a while, but I will go over some of the key ones that kind of have helped generate this, this debate. All right, and it starts on Cyprus, actually. The very first claim for an Aegean Paleolithic was made by Vita Finzi in 1973. And he's an environmental archaeologist who believed that several, around five um, flint artifacts were, that were found on a fossil beach and he, he claimed were found within a red clayey silt layer um, near the river of Ziggy, or near the near a river east of Ziggy, pardon me, um, on the southeast coast of the island, were Paleolithic. And he thought they, well, first he said they were pre-Neolithic, but later he said he thought they were middle Paleolithic. And that's largely because he said that the context from which they derived um, were, uh, was old, or at least Pleistocene age. The problem is that no one knows where that context was. Um, there was a single little publication of these finds. They haven't been systematically um, kind of uh, described. And so, and in the 70s, no one was thinking about Paleolithic in the islands. And again, I should note that Cyprus is just like Crete. It's what's called an oceanic island. So anything found on Cyprus also suggests open water travel. And so that, that kind of fell to the, you know, the um, um, kind of, cobwebs of history, I guess, when it wasn't really uh, taken seriously. Um, but another study on Cyprus that kind of pushed this um, idea of a Paleolithic Cyprus into the spotlight was by Jim Adavazio about five years later. Um, he was working in the Krisuku uh, drainage river, or river drainage, pardon me, and he had found some Neolithic fine spots and a series of flakes that had the prepared core uh, platforms, like I mentioned vertical strikes down on a platform that seemed to be middle Paleolithic. And so he thought that these um, seemed to be pretty convincing for a Paleolithic, and that early claim by Vita Finzi might be, need to be taken seriously. The problem was that when, it, when this site was revisited by later archaeologists, they found a ton of groundstone tools in, this, in these fine spots that were on the surface, by the way. And so in general, the consensus was and the latest one by Alan Simmons was that these were probably Neolithic flake tools that just happened to have this technology, maybe a form of what's called convergent evolution, which is basically two different populations solving a problem the same way, and it just so happens that they look the same. And so that also kind of was just dropped. 
The next claim came in the 80s by the, um, an archaeologist working with the, with the French school in Athens on the northwest coast of, uh, western coast of Naxos. And this site was discovered um, in 1983, and the report suggested that the, a few tools, blades, notched flakes, and cores, on a site called Stelita, which was an uplifted hill slope, but kind of out overlooked the whole uh, bay, was Paleolithic. And ultimately, archaeological investigations were reinitiated uh, re uh, by the Greek Ministry of Culture in 2000 um, in the context of increasing modern development um, by Olga Velanutu, and then the head of the Naxos Museum. Um, and they suggested that the site may actually have not only um, pre-Neolithic, but also potentially upper Paleolithic, based on the presence of these blades. We talked about these blades, this kind of systematic reduction technique that seems to be upper Paleolithic. So that was another find in the 80s that kind of suggested maybe there was an Aegean Paleolithic. And these two, these two islands, both Naxos and, and Cyprus, really are credited with the beginning of the Aegean Paleolithic debate. But so far, of course, there had been no uh, context to these artifacts, and so it wasn't really taken very seriously. And so you see papers later by guys like Cyprian Broodbank, Professor Cyprian Broodbank, and Professor John Cherry, who published influential papers that kind of noted this and said, you know, we have to be careful about if we're going to say there's a Paleolithic based on the evidence we find. But that was later in 2001, we see actually perhaps some of the best examples of potential Paleolithic finds on the island of Milos. And this is on the east coast at a site called Triadon Bay. And um, a geologist named Heladonio, an Italian geologist, um, was working at, um, on the west coast on some raised, what are called marine terraces. All right, Marine terraces are associated with um, the last sea level, which will wave action will plane off the land. And then as it's uplifted, you get this staircase effect. I'll talk more about that later. But he found around 126 chipped stone tools, um, and this included what are called tayak points, which is not really necessary to understand other than it's a type of hand axe, um, but also uh, small bifaces um, and this, like this chop, these choppers here on the left. And the, the interesting thing about this site, even though they were found on the surface again, were that they were made of this beautiful rhyolite, this banded rhyolite, a volcanic uh, rock. And the rhyolite is actually local to Milos. So where he found them was next to this band of um, rhyolite. And so uh, it uh, was a, it an interesting find. Unfortunately, it was also published in a small chapter that was only written in Italian. And all he mentions is finding them, and he shows these beautiful photos. But there's no measurements or systematic descriptions or anything like that, um, nor were any um, actually buried context found. Another discovery in 2009 was on the island of Gavdos. And this one's interesting because Gavdos, if you can see, it's at the very bottom of the slide there, is the southernmost of the Aegean Islands. And actually, it's in the Libyan Sea. Um, but it's 38 kilometers off the coast of Crete. And two Greek archaeologists, Kupaka and Metsanis, found uh, potential evidence for not only uh, lower Paleolithic, but also Middle Paleolithic and Upper Paleolithic, um, and, and Bronze Age, too, on a, a series of sites, multiple sites, hill slope sites, and sites that are called alluvial fans, um, but also beach. Um, like this hand axe on the left here, um, they found on, it was made of a purple limestone, and they found it in a beach context. Um, and they also found um, a, a lot of chopper tools made on quartz that they say were found on a, on a hilly promontory and they mention that the tools were found on a very intense red deposit, is what they say. Now, unfortunately, yet again, as you see, the story that continues here is that these finds were found on a surface, and they lacked context. They were not be, we weren't able to date them. So I keep mentioning this. When you find tools on the surface, we can suggest that they date to a certain time period, but we can't know that, right? And as I mentioned earlier on, NAC, on Cyprus, um, there's the idea of convergent evolution. What if people are simply solving the same problem the same way? And so this is why the, de the debates occur. Now we return to the site that I began the lecture on, and that is the discovery of these quartz tools on the island of Crete by Professors Strasser and Runnels. 
Now, their survey in 2009, um, which was published in 2010 and 2011, and then later in 2015, um, found 28 different find spots associated with caves, but also paleosols, which I'll uh, discuss, and alluvial fans strung across um, the, what's called the Prevly Gorge. They found tools like these hand axes here on the left and chopper tools on the right um, that were um, not only um, associated with potentially lower Paleolithic, but they also found tools that appeared to have this prepared core technology like we discussed in the Middle Paleolithic. Five of the sites are associated with marine terraces and on paleosols. And so um, there was also, I should also note that they were, uh, there were mesolithic uh, tools as well. And I keep using the term paleosol, here's what I mean. I'm talking about this red soil here, which if you recall was also discussed by Vita Finzi and those on Gavdos and also on Milos. Now at the time, um, by now, this site has been dated, but at the time in 2014, and there was there's some other sites in there that were that were uh, also found in the Aegean, but for the most part, all of them are found on the surface. And if they were dated, they were found close to the mainland, so that they were probably not they're not really islands; they're islands today, but they were probably attached to the mainland at the time that those tools were there. So um, I should say that. But at the time in 2014. Um, because of this debate and because of these discoveries, you had this paper come out by Cyprian Broodbank titled, So What? Does the Paradigm Currently Want to Budge So Much? And his point, which is well made, was that at the time there were, you know, very um, few finds in context with no direct ages, even though Plakias, which we just saw, it's not exactly a surface find. We saw the Paleosol. There were tools in them. Um, but um, there was only one excavation, a site that I didn't mention, an excellent archaeologist named Nina Galanidu is excavating on the site of um, Rodok Nidia on Lesbos. Um, but that's one of those sites that probably was connected to the mainland during most of the Pleistocene. So even though this site, which is around at least 250,000 years old, but a little older probably, um, was probably a key staging ground for the initial movement into the Aegean, it isn't an, technically an island. Um, but there are also no features. and so. Ultimately, what Broodbank pointed out was that if we really want to understand the Aegean Paleolithic, if we want to demonstrate that there were peoples crossing into the islands at a different time than the Mesolithic, we must find Pleistocene Age sites that are buried in deposits that we can date, that we can excavate, we can demonstrate that peoples were there. And so this is where I will continue my story of when I was an undergraduate and I heard about this discovery because that was in 2010, and then a year later in 2011, I would be coming up to Oregon to study geoarchaeology at Oregon State University working with Dr. Lauren Davis. And it's really at Oregon, here in Oregon, where I learned the foundations of geoarchaeology that kind of led to um, the foundations of this talk. And what I learned at, Geo uh, at Oregon State was that, you know, the traditional idea of geoarchaeology, if you've ever heard of this field, is that it's simply the application of methods in the earth sciences or geosciences to solve archaeological problems. But what I learned in Oregon from Lauren was that it's not just methods, but there's a lot of theory involved that geoarchaeologists use that are very important to understand because they allow us to adopt what's, what I call a geoarchaeological lens and apply that to the archaeological record. Okay? And what I mean by that is geoarchaeologists First and, forma, for, first and foremost, excuse me, um, put a focus on context. And if we think about um, this review I just gave you, the key was that it's all contextless, right? We're missing the deposits that these tools used to be in. And so geoarchaeology really focuses on context, which we can also call stratigraphy, um, and that is sediments and soils. Now, for those of you in the crowd that know me, um, will know that I will never miss an opportunity to teach the difference between sediments and soils. And so that's what I'm about to do. And if there's one thing you, I hope you leave more, with more than one, but if there's one thing you leave with, know the difference between sediments and soils. And I'll tell you why in the second part about why it's so important. Now, sediments are the organic and inorganic particles that are accumulated due to erosion and deposition. These are the particles, the minerals and rocks that are moving around per the landscape, whether it's a beach environment or a delta, river environment or a hill slope, all right? And it could be boulders, it could be sand. You can imagine actually beach sand in your head, 
um, those are sediments, right? And the reason why it's important to know sediments is because, because sediments are moving. If you find an artifact and a bone in a sediment that has been moving, you cannot prove that those two, that bone and that artifact, actually belong together, right? So it's not just about finding the context, but it's about understanding the context, which is what geoarchaeology is all about. Now, more importantly, when things stop moving, or I shouldn't say more importantly, but let me just say that sediments are what's burying sites. You need to have sediments that are deposited to actually have a site preserved, right? Pompeii is preserved by pyroclastic sediments. But it's not just when sediments are moving, it's also when they stop moving. <clears throat> Excuse me. When sediments stop moving, oh no, <laughs> went down the wrong tube. That's what I get for uh, taking a drink of water. <clears throat> when the sediments stop moving, what happens is you get soils forming. <clears throat> so this model I have here is, is one model of how soils form, which is uh, the weathering of, of parent material. But you can also just kind of move that aside and put sediments there like beach sands. Soils are the in situ weathering profile of sediments. So soils develop on top of sediments. And you know, there's this lovely acronym here that rolls off the tongue called CLORPT. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> CLORPT is, uh, is just, this is, these are the variables that help us, these are the soil pathways. These are what help us, to, uh, what soils form. You can think of soils like an organism. And in fact, um, soils, there are baby soils. And baby soils have certain t characteristics. There are, um, and actually, this, this left, most left and most panel here is called the parent material. That's because soils grow based on the various regional climates, and the, you know, um, the organisms, the topographic relief, um, the type of material that's there, the type of minerals that the soil is growing on, whether it's beach sands made of quartz or, um, you know, calcium limestones in Greece, but also time. Okay, why am I telling you all this? That's because when, when the landscape is stable and soils are forming on these sediments, guess what, uh, what else is forming? Vegetation, therefore animals, therefore people. And so when you find buried soils, you have a better opportunity of finding artifacts that are in context. Those artifacts belong there. Whereas sediments, they, who knows where they came from, right? They could have come from the top of the hill or further away. The other key thing is that not only are soils important for a higher probabil probability of artifacts being placed there when you find them, but the two variables there, climate and time, mean that because they grow over time, like in this figure, we can use them as, just like the artifacts are used as fossils essentially to find yourself in time, we can use various soils as fossils to find yourself in time. So when you combine the discovery of Paleolithic tools, like the ones we just reviewed, with this understanding of soil development, you can start to get a better understanding about where, why, and also how archaeological sites form. Okay? So pay attention there that A horizon I mentioned earlier, that's the baby soil I mentioned, and the B horizon is called an alluvial horizon, and that's the one that will gain regional characteristics based on the environment of that time. A 100,000-year-old soil that formed 100,000 years ago is going to look different than a soil forming today because the environment was different. It will have different structures based on the amount of time that's developed, and it will have a different color. And when we measure these things, this is how we reconstruct past climates. Okay? So, the other idea with understanding um, sediments and soils and how that helps us understand context is that we also need to understand the mechanisms that are allowing us to um, understand how they're preserved or destroyed, right? Um, and that's called archaeological site formation theory. So site formation theory. Um, and understanding sediments and soils and formation theory, how sites are formed, allows us to place the artifacts in their broader landscape context, and therefore we can understand how past humans interacted with that environment or how that interact environment interacted with humans, all right? And so that's geoarchaeological theory. We use methods like stratigraphy um, and you know, geochemistry and things like that in geoarchaeology all the time. But, and those are the methods that are, that are key, but it's the theory that allow us to properly apply those methods. 
Okay, so it's this understanding that I gained at Oregon that um, I took with me and started to chew on this problem of the GM Paleolithic. At the time, I was working on the peopling of the New World, of the Americas, but I realized that the debate of the peopling of the Americas was actually very similar to the peopling of the Greek islands. In fact, it was kind of similar temporally as well in the earliest part, whether it's a, what's called a pre-Clovis debate or a pre-Mesolithic debate. They're both around 12,000 years old, and so it was, um, it was just a similar analogy. And so I started to think about how geoarchaeology could um, help us solve this problem. And so, as I mentioned on Crete, uh, Professor Curtis Reynolds at Boston University had been um, excavating there, and so I sent him an email. And I started a dialogue with him about, and we started to discuss how um, geoarchaeology might help us address this. And I learned that he himself was a geoarchaeologist, and he had been applying methods about soils and working on it for the last 40 years, 30 years, on mainland Greece. And so we had a great discussion, and that's where I ended up going to do my, my PhD to work with him. And it was fortuitous because at the time, he had you know, his finger on all the current sites that are going on, everything that's going on, and so he introduced me to um, an excellent archaeologist named Professor Tristan Carter. And Tristan Carter, if we remember in 2014, there was this debate about, we need buried sites, right? Like, cool, Paleolithic, but we need sites. And Professor Carter had been saying, well, okay, let's go look at Naxos. As this is one of the sites I mentioned earlier that had the potential to have Paleolithic stone tools. And so uh, Professor Carter initiated a, um, a survey called the Stelita Naxos Archaeological Project. And um, Curtis, and had, we had talked to Tristan, and, and Curtis and I had talked to, and I was lucky enough to be able to join that project as a geoarchaeologist. Um, of course, before I joined, um, they had started another survey. And um, the, I should say the Stelita Naxos Archaeological Project was a um, collaboration with the um, Salatic effort of Antiquities. And he was working with Dimitris Athanasoulis. And so they started their project and um, initially began a survey, which became an excavation, which I'll talk about now. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Naxos, it is in the center of the Cyclades on the far left. It's right in the center. And it's also the largest island of the Cyclades. And the site, um, Stelita, is on the west coast here, as you can see. And it's this uplifted kind of promontory, this hill slope. It's a double-peaked hill slope, which looks like this right in the middle there. You can see the beautiful kind of view, viewscape it has um, already. And that's important because not only is it an amazing viewscape that allows you to see for hundreds of kilometers, but the bedrock, which is sticking out in various places and has been quarried there on the right, is actually chert. The whole bedrock of this uplifted hill slope is a raw material that can be used to make stone tools. It's a quarry site. So, I think already you can see why people would be coming there. Um, and indeed, the early surveys by Professor Carter were able to demonstrate in 2013 to 2014 that these early surveys by the French school and then later by the um, Greek Ministry of Culture were right that there did appear to be Paleolithic tools all over this hill slope. Not only Mesolithic, but Upper Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic, and potentially Lower Paleolithic. This lower Paleolithic handex, um, potential lower Paleolithic handex in the bottom right there is made of something called emery, which is uh, a raw material on Naxos that is uh, kilometers away. So, you know, it had to have been um, cultural. Now, um, they, lo they found around 30,000 artifacts on the surface of the hill. And, um, you know, but the, the idea was, as Brubank had pointed out in 2014, this is nice and all, but it still doesn't. It's just another surface find, right? It's still in this narrative of contextless finds. So prove it. Prove to us that you have Paleolithic. And so that's when the excavation began in 2015, and that's when I was able to join on the project. So working with um, Dr. Dan Contreras at the University of Florida and Takis Karkanis at the American School and the Wiener Lab for Archaeological Science, um, we were able to um, come up with a game plan, a geoarchaeological research design for how we were going to kind of demonstrate this, um, this site. First, we needed to constru construct a stratigraphic framework, understand both the sediments and soils as we excavate, right? So this is a hill slope context, which we knew was going to be quite complex. And actually, I hadn't joined yet. Um, Dr. Karkanis and Professor Carter and, and Dan Contreras had uh, worked around the hill slope to find where they thought the best locations were. It turns out they did a pretty good job. 
Um, and the other thing was uh, Professor Carter had began working with the University of Bordeaux, uh, Chris, Christelle LaHaye, who is a um, uh, nuclear physicist, essentially, and she dates, our, um, she dates sediments and soils using a method called optically stimulated luminescence, which I'll define next. And so the goal there was it's not, not only do we need to find buried tools, but they need to be dated as well, right? So that was the goal. We need to find the final nail in the coffin to, to solve this debate. So in real brief, I promise I won't put you through it too much, but optically stimulated luminescence dating, which is a mouthful, is essentially what you're doing is you're dating not the artifacts, again, we're focused on the context, you're dating the last time the sediments were exposed to light, in this case, the sun. Okay, and you can see on the left there, like this beach. That beach was deposited there, say, 50,000 years ago. When those grains move and say artifacts, they bury artifacts, if you date those grains on that second time, the last time they saw the sun, you know a minimum age for those artifacts, right? The artifacts had to have been made before that happened. So that's how this approach works. And if you do it on a stratified site, you can bracket ar archeological remains. The reason why we had to do this is because there was no organic preservation and we couldn't radiocarbon date. All right, so in the early days, in 2015, our initial results, we had mixed results. We were both happy and intimidated, um, mainly because you can see that the stratigraphy there is pretty complex off the get-go, right? If you look at those upper figures, it's, it's what's called colluvium, it's gravity-based deposition from the top of the hill slope, stuff moving down the hill slope. But we were also happy because you can see that our, these four trenches that we had opened, they all look the same. So it's not so complex. There's, it's suggesting we might be able to figure this out. And on top of that, we have a soil on the bottom. And remember I mentioned that you need to be able to separate the sediments in the soil. Those top units there are pretty much so sediments except for that very top one, which is the you know, modern topsoil which develops. You can see them outside right now. Um, under that's the sediments. And then that bottom red unit there was a, was a, a nice soil. And so that was uh, promising. But really, due to the, you know, the, location, the trench locations of Professor Carter and Takis Karkanis and Dan earlier, um, in the earlier years, we were able to find a unit that was much deeper. If you start on the top left, this is at the top of the hill slope, and then if you look at the right, you can see the almost four meters of sediments and soils that we uncovered there, which is pretty abnormal. Any of you who have worked on hill slopes at the top of a hill slope, the idea is usually you're going to find maybe shallow 20, 50 centimeters worth of stuff. Now, this isn't at the very top. You can see the top up there, which I should note, there's a uh, newly discovered uh, Minoan um, sanctuary up there. That, that's what they're working on now. But in this part, we found these four meters of um, sediments. And it's difficult to see. I understand that, believe me, um, after staring at it for years. But ultimately, what we're looking at is not only stratified deposits like we saw on the top, which are called colluvium, but there's also a dune ramp. Um, LU5 there is, is actually alien with some coarse input. It was a, a dune ramp that was draped around um, Stolita, around the hill slope, which is pretty cool to think about. Um, and then there's a soil formed on, that, on those sediments. Below that in LU6, there is a, um, what's a mud flow, is a highly saturated deposit with a soil developed on it. You can see the tree roots growing through it. Um, which is another massive soil. And then below that was yet another soil, this orangish color on the, or yellowish color on the bottom, LU7. There's another deposit like those on the top, this colluvial deposit, but it had been stable for so long that a, a soil developed on it, and the yellow you see there is calcium carbonate. It's called a calcic soil. So there were three major soils at the bottom of this. The other promising aspect of this that we were happy to see was that stone tools occurred all throughout this sequence of deposits. And I just put up the counts here um, just to show you, you know, how many there were, which, which was nice. Um, and these tools went all the way down to LU7 and um, all through um, all the units, except for the bottom LU8, which is the basically weathered bedrock. So no stone tools there. Now the next step, we had stone tools and we had deposits. We needed to date them. And so that's when we, we began working with Christelle LaHaye and Ninon Teffen at the University of Bordeaux to get OSL. And you can see in the very beginning, these early dates here, 12,000, 14,000, 18,000, we were getting exciting. You know, it's upper Paleolithic, Mesolithic ages. But at the very bottom is when we started to realize, wow, these deposits are a lot older than we think. LU6 was dated to 94,000 plus or minus 6,000, and LU7 is 198,000 
So around 200,000 and around 100,000, basically. And so that's, this um, stuff was all published in 2019 in Science Advances. So if you want to read more about it, um, there's, it's all detailed in there. And so that was when we realized that um, you know, we had not only excuse me, upper paleolithic tools, like these scrapers and what are called um, you know, burins um, or back blades, like these. These are illustrated by our, um, one of our lithicists, uh, Denitza Mihalovic. Uh, middle Paleolithic tools, like this Mysterian point, pseudo Lavawa point, as well as uh, this potential uh, lower Paleolithic biface, but all the tools in the LU7, which are lower Paleolithic age, were mainly of the core chopper variety. Now, the, the other thing was that, that was in, this was all in 2015 to 2017. And since then, I can tell you that the good news is that things have become more complex than that. We've excavated more. The site is not limited to this single unit, but there are a variety of buried deposits like these across the hill slope, which we've now excavated. And we're in the process of dating them. So stay tuned for those, um, those publications because we'll have a whole new series of deposits with dates and artifacts from those coming out, including uh, the dark gray areas, which are hearths. So that's nice. So the results are that Stolita allowed us to find stratified deposits and date them. It suggests people were on Naxos by 200,000 years ago, um, and certainly 100,000 years ago, like those finds on Crete. And so it further supports the hypothesis for an Aegean Paleolithic. That's it, right? Done and dusted. Problem solved. Not really. <laughs> certainly, I think that what I would say here is that now we're, what we're doing is shifting away from whether or not there's an Aegean Paleolithic and where it is, right? We, I think the case is closed whether or not there's an Aegean Paleolithic. I would stand by that. But there are still some outstanding questions that remain that we need to work on. The chronological resolution we have is coarse. Um, we have um, OSL dates of around 250,000 on Lesvos, 100,000 now on Crete at Palakias, 113,000. And we have our dates on Stelita, but they're all this method, optically stimulated luminescence. They're all dating sediments. They're dating deposition, not necessarily when people were there. It certainly dates when people, uh, the minimal age that they could have been there, right? But not exactly when they were there. And this is important, as I'll show you in the next part. It's also difficult because of this to evaluate this idea of seafaring or seagoing. If we don't have the dates nailed down, how can we prove whether people cross big open uh, bodies of water or short ones, right? And I'll show you an example of why that's important too. There's also no fossil remains. So if we're going to talk about species, well, we don't have actual dated fossils. Um, and so again, we need more buried and dated sites and we need more sites that are dated in different ways as well to help provide multiple lines of evidence of the chronology of the GM Paleolithic. Okay, now, the thing is, is that this debate about all these surface sites, everyone was so focused on the fact that they're from the surface. So therefore, they don't tell us anything, they would say. But I think there's a lot to be learned from these surface sites. In, in particular, the fact that these artifacts were found, they used to be in, in deposits. And where they are now, they're simply eroded. And so, when we're starting to understand where sites should be, which is what my big question is, and my main focus of my research, is we can actually start to look at the settings that all these surface finds were found in. And you start to see some very common patterns. And I mentioned one earlier that you notice a lot of these finds are mentioning the presence of red soils, right? Pleistocene soils that were assumedly Pleistocene soils. They're in coastal and near coastal settings. Uh, they're commonly in these uplifted geomorphic settings, what are called marine terraces and alluvial fans and hill slopes. And they're always by these soils. I call them argillic, you can call these B horizons that are reddened, they're clay rich argillic horizons, and these calcium carbonate one like you saw at the bottom of Stelita is calcic. Okay, so what I, this is really, um, when I mentioned the foundations of geoarchaeology at Oregon State, this is pretty much one of the, the main lessons that I learned from Lauren, and that is finding deposits of the right age. He calls it the Dora approach. Um, but basically, how can we use geoarchaeology to help make predictions about where age-specific deposits may be or not. So here's, here's the idea. If someone asks me, Justin, um, how many Paleolithic sites do you think should be in the Greek islands? I would say I have no idea. But I can tell you how much Pleistocene soil there is. We can map that, 
right? If we want to know where 100,000-year-old uh, sites are, we just need to know where the 100,000-year-old soil is. Obviously, there's a lot of it, but we can start to map it and systematically survey that. A lot of these early surveys that were looking for Paleolithic sites were art, what I call artifact-centric research designs. They're classic pedestrian survey approaches where they're looking for artifacts, right? Well, that's what you do, and it's very successful. But this approach changes the main analytical unit of study to the deposit, sediments, and soils. So rather than surveying for artifacts, you survey for deposits. And these things don't have to cancel each other out. They should just happen at the same time. And, and that does occur. So I'm going to give you a, a brief case study about how this works, um, just so you understand what I mean by how this geoarchaeological approach can help us find sites. And I'm going to use Crete as an example. All right, so the first thing you need to do is understand um, the processes that I say are filtering the archaeological record. By that I mean you have, we know there was this population of pristine archaeological sites and we need to understand the processes that have ground them down to small little bits that we find today. And this demands an understanding of, of climate histories, tectonic histories, but also environmental conditions, all right? The first thing you need to know, need to know about the Pleistocene, especially in the Aegean Islands, is that the Pleistocene is made up of pretty predictable around 100,000 year old orbital cycles of sea level rise and fall, all right? When periods um, are, the temperatures are warmer in past periods, the sea levels are higher. And these are called interglacials. And that's what we're in today. And so when you have interglacials like these that we have across um, in this figure here, you have islands. In the glacial periods when the temperatures are cooler, temperatures are cooler, there is less water because they're taken up in the ice caps, and so there's more land that is revealed. And as you can imagine, this has major implications for where you would expect to find archaeological sites, but also what the Greek islands looked like. This is a model um, first developed by Lycusis, and this is a figure later uh, developed by Vangeli Trelukas, another um, great geoarchaeologist in Greece. And um, if you look at, say, 30,000 to 18,000 years ago, the Greek islands were much different. Actually, islands like Naxos, Paros, and Mykonos were all connected into a mega island called Cycladia. So if you think about understanding humans at Stelita, which is found near the coast today, that's actually an upland site. So it's, it's very different. In fact, 180,000 years ago during a, a glacial period, um, not only was Naxos uh, attached to something like Cycladia, but it was attached to mainland Greece. It was a massive peninsula that came out, like you can see in the top right figure there. And then the bottom two, which are, for me, some of the most interesting, is that this is, uh, this paper here, Lucas and Carcanus, what they pointed out is not only um, would you have massive land bridges that connected Anatolia and mainland Greece, but this land bridge would have been pristine ecosystems. You can see the negative places in the bottom right and left there, those are massive lakes. So you would have had very rich river valleys and freshwater lakes. And so the, the story really, which is a shame, is um, not only is most of the Paleolithic buried underwater today, but probably the best part of the Paleolithic is buried underwater today. And so um, we can't say, oh, it's not that Paleolithic peoples aren't, weren't in the Greek islands. It's that the dirt from which their material footprint is preserved is just simply gone. And so what we have to do then is apply these methods to understand how we can better predict where these little paleo remnants, they're called, exist. Actually, the Greek islands that we're on today, you can think of them as paleo mountaintops. They're the highest elevation of these once vast land bridges. I mentioned soils, and I keep mentioning this idea for red color. And this is a model created by Van Andel and also Curtis Runnels in the 90s. And this is for Epirus. Now, I'm not going to say that this is exactly how it works all over Greece, but I will tell you that generally you do see patterns. They worked it out for Epirus, but you could do this anywhere. And all the way across Greece, all the way to Israel, you can see that as time continues, you get more reddening from, from the top that's the youngest and the bottom is the oldest. And as you can see, it gets in the middle is a color. It gets red, more red, more red, stronger brown, stronger red. And on the right is what's called structure. I mentioned that soils are organisms and they grow. Well, as they grow, they gain more characteristics. They start out, if you go outside and put a hole under the grass, you're going to see that the structure is granular.
But if you put a, dig a same hole in a 130,000 year old um, soil, it's going to look like this one on the bottom right, like the one we found at the bottom of Naxos, and like the ones that Curtis Reynolds found on the southern coast of Crete. And so when you combine our understanding of sea level rise and change with what color the soils are going to be and the structure they are, and then we consider the tectonic setting. The Aegean Islands are one of the most active, if not the most actively tectonic regions in the world. And the story for Aegean you know, tectonics goes like this. The North African plate on the bottom here is being subducted, and subducted meaning it's going under this um, Anatolian plate here in the, in the north. And so as it's going down, it's pushing up the southern coast of Crete. You can see the red there. So just know that in the Aegean, you have, if it's a plain, it's being pushed up from the south and then tilted over. And so if you think about that, the way that sea level rise is going to affect various parts of the islands differently. And on Crete, which we're focusing on now, this means that on the southern coast, what you have are these marine terraces. Each of these lines here on the stairs there represent ancient coastal areas where wave action were. That's where the sea was. And you can see on the left, up to 140 meters above sea level today, that's where the um, last interglacial, which is 130,000 years ago, was. That's where the sea level was then. So if you were trying to find sites, you actually have to be pretty high up off the ground, right? And you know that we know this because, um, one, we've dated them, but also you can see here on the right, these are boreholes from a you know, rock-eating species, boring species that are only associated with marine, with water, underwater. And these are uplifted up around 80 uh, meters above sea level. And this is actually where uh, Curtis and Tom found their site on the south southern coast of Crete. And not only that, but they found that on these marine terraces, because at one point they were near sea level, the deposits that are being put there are coming down from the mountains behind in alluvial fans, right? And then they're stable and the soils develop on them. And then over the next 100,000 years, they're slowly uplifted. And all you get now are these old soils that are 100,000 years old, but that are, that are up to 80 meters above sea level. And this is an example here. And I wanted to point this out because this is the later um, work by, on the right, um, Carl Wegman and Curtis Reynolds. And they actually dated this soil to around 113,000 years old. Now, here's another example. It's a bit more subtle, but you can see in the background, there's a, kind of a real life example of the staircase effect. Um, this is at another area on the southern coast of Crete, uh, of Crete. And these are the soils on the bottom. You can see these reddened or argillic horizons. But also, um, we found that there's something called aeolianite, which is like beach sands that have been cemented. Okay? And there are shells that are preserved within there, and there are soils developed on top of those. And so, now, if you consider this picture for southern coast of Crete, and you consider the northern coast, those alluvial fans that I mentioned that were coming down on the southern coast that have now been eroded, this is what they used to look like. On the northern coast, they're still there because uplift is not happening, and so water, as it's coming, is not eroding them all down. These fans stretch out across, or well, they used to stretch out all the way out into the sea here. And on the right, we can see our um, soils, which the bottom one there that um, Floyd McCoy is pointing to is the exact same age as those on the southern coast that are 100 meters above sea level, or 80, 80 to 100 meters above sea level. And they're on the modern beach. And so here's what they look like from a, a nice profile view. And this, was the, this is what the north coast used to look like before it was uplifted. The mountains in the back are pushing out through rivers and water and erosion. They're pushing out the sediments, right? And then during more calmer periods in the past environmental and past in our past environment and climate history, those soils develop. You can see them. Then, you know, more uh, climate warms up, more water comes out, and then you get the sediments and it occurs over and over again. And, and now we've dated these deposits from 100,000 all the way up to 12,000. And so they have these huge packages and these, these string of alluvial fans exist all up and down the northern coast. And so the point is, is that by understanding how these um, you know, past processes, um, climate, environmental, or tectonic, are affecting, oops, excuse me, affecting the preservation of sites, we can start to better orient how we find sites. And the good news is that we can take this knowledge from Crete, extrapolate it out, and apply it all across the Aegean. 
Um, and I think that this model I pro uh, provided here, which is admittedly simple, but, but it's a straightforward and clear-cut model, it can be applied to any of those islands on the southern coast because they have the same tectonic setting. Now, it gets more stable as you move north, but islands like um, Carpathos and Rhodes, which are also pretty large, those should be totally targeted as soon as like tomorrow, yesterday, you know? Those would be ripe areas to find Paleolithic sites. Um, obviously, Crete is a, is a key area because any site, if we want to nail down this idea of seafaring, then Crete is, or Cyprus are going to be where you do it. Other sites too, like we mentioned Stelita. Stelita is on this hill slope. But in it, I mentioned it's a, a chert formation, right? It's a raw material source that's been uplifted. And that formation continues across the Aegean. Paros, Mykonos, there are similar hill slopes. Those are obviously primary spots that should be surveyed for sites. But also, these, because of this, because we know um, that people were there at least 200,000 years ago, I think we should also take some of these claims, like Vita Finzi's claim on Cyprus, who mentioned the discovery of red soils where he found his tools, and Milos, Gavdos too, they mentioned intense red soil where they found their artifacts on the surface. That suggests that there are deposits that should have, or at least could have, artifacts in them of Paleolithic age. These sites like Milos, Gavdos, and Cyprus also need to be key um, places of focus. And so I think that, um, you know, clearly, the geoarchaeological, geoarchaeological lens in Aegean archaeology provides us with this deposit-centered approach that can help us start unraveling this problem. And it's also crucial, like we saw at Naxos, for establishing stratigraphic integrity and chronological control for which to further understand the Aegean Paleolithic. And so if we return to the main question of the night, you know, were Ice Age seafarers in the Aegean? I think that the answer is absolutely. And I think that Crete demonstrates that because Crete was always an island. And I think that the time depth that Naxos provides up to 200,000 years ago is just a first step and it's only, only going to get older. And I think that, you know, clearly much more work needs to be done. And I hope that this approach here can be used to help us find more sites. Um, but if we're, you know, I think that hopefully tonight, I've convinced you that whatever future discoveries are going to be found um, in the Aegean Basin, that geoarchaeology will be at the forefront. Thank you. Sure. So I understand that one of the things that you would like to find are hominin or human fossils. Right. And I assume you wouldn't necessarily find them right at the work site that's before you. So maybe more at sites where they actually lived. Where would those be? Well, under the water by now. No. <laughs> um, you know, I think probably the best case, and there's another. I, I went into this very specific coastal approach to how geoarchy, where we should look for sites, but there's another one that I didn't mention that actually um, did a paper in Quaternion International in um, 2020 outlining this deposit standard approach where I, I talk about inverted, what are called inverted basins. And these basins were once rich, lush um, uh, basins that had rivers um, deposited within them. They were internally drained and they were, you know, marshy and animals would go there. Um, and actually on, on Crete, you can see that these basins are now, the water has been diverted away. They're just these dried settings that are full of animal bones. And, um, and that's where I would say you would look for human fossils. In fact, um, Katerina Hervati and, um, at the University of Tübingen and um, Vangeli Trulukas, they also use this deposit-centered uh, approach. But they've really focused on, you could say it, a, a bone-centered approach, fossil-centered approach, where they're looking for deposits too, but they're also combining it with uh, animals of the right age. And they'll go there and look for um, fossils. And, th and that's actually where, you know, if you look at a key site like Marathusa that's on the mainland in the Megalopolis Basin, um, they had found a, a hominin tooth there. And, um, and so that's where you would probably look to find fossils. The problem is that uh, the soils, commonly people will say, well, soils in Greece are, are uh, you know, alkaline because of limestone, which is true, but they're also acidic. 
because of modern conditions. And so what you get is these, you know, acidic dirt on top due to, due to the modern environmental conditions and these buried calcic soils. So it's just both. You don't get good fossil preservation and you don't get good phytolith preservation until the, these younger ones. And so the problem at Salida is we just, we only have the preservation of things like phytoliths, which are ancient plant fossils, like those little microscopic silica parts of a plant in the top horizons, and they just don't preserve in the lower ones. We don't have wood preserved in the lower ones. We don't have bones preserved. Um, so the other thing is, is these basins have the types of deposits like um, water that's been buried and turns into peat, which is excellent for preservation, like at Marathusa. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but I don't know where they would necessarily live. Um, but I, I, I guess you could say, you know, the idea that they lived in rock shelters is kind of outmoded. That's not really true. In reality, they live more like outside of them. Um, but I think, yeah, I guess that's what I would say. I mean, I, I, I'm not holding out for finding a, a, a hominin fossil, to be honest. I just don't, I don't think it's, it, it's very, it's going to be very hard to do. That's what I would say. The stone tools, as John Shea um, says at Stony Brook University, provide the best record of evolutionary history because they do not erode. We have stone tools going all the way back to three million years, you know, and they don't, they don't weather. So they might get a patina on them, but you will still find them. Any other questions? Right, um, sure, okay, so the question is um, how um, the, the, on a hill slope, how we found the right locations to excavate, right? And, you know, that was partly because of um, Takis Carcanis as a genius, but also, <laughs> no, um, really what, what they did was they looked at um, areas, him and Dan Contreras looked for areas where um, the bedrock had been exposed on the, on the relief, providing a natural trap for sediments. And that first unit, the deep one in unit one, um, was in what's called a debris cone. And on hill slopes, you'll get these natural areas that are, uh, you'll see two boulders or something, and you can see stuff just coming out. And so the idea was, this is a natural depot center, and so maybe the most deposits are preserved there. And, and that indeed uh, was the case, and these other units we're starting to find out that anywhere you see these boulders sticking out and then it's flat, um, there are these, it's micro topography, right? And they're bearing uh, deep deposits as well. So that, that's how you did it, how we did it. Right. Um, you were looking forward at future projects. Um, yeah. do you, what, what is the future for Paleolithic research in the Aegean Basin? Well, um, there, I know of people that are hoping for permits for certain things. There's a, a cave on Crete uh, that hopefully will happen. Um, it's known to be Neolithic, and I think that is probably the most exciting prospect that we have. Um, and, you know, that is going to be... The thing about caves and rock shelters is that even though people may or may not be there, and actually a lot of the caves in Greece and the Greek islands have no evidence of, of human habitation. There's a lot of bones, a lot of, you know pygmy deer and things like that. Um, but they provide the best preservation conditions. And so if you find them, you're going to find hearths, you might find burials. And um, so it, it, it's even, and again, anything on Crete is early to earliest evidence of clear cut open water travel, right? So even if it's upper Paleolithic, it's a big deal. And Tom Strasser has a paper and an argument where he thinks some of the cave art on Crete is upper Paleolithic. And I think that um, there's no reason why upper Paleo Paleolithic peoples wouldn't have been there. Um, other projects, um, I don't know of any. I, uh, Stolita is ongoing um, with the discovery of this um, ritual uh, Minoan peak sanctuary at the top of Stolita, kind of hindered us a bit because you know we're there for Paleolithic, but now we have the only known peak sanctuary of Minoan that far north, right? So, and that, that paper um, just came out by Professor Carter and um, a PhD student who should be done by now, Christine Mallinson, and is also a great archeologist. And um, I think that um, I would, 
personally like to be on Rhodes or Carpathos like tomorrow because I think I just think those two islands are going to be where the new Paleolithic sites are found. Also Crete, um, mainly because if you notice, if you notice actually, um, Naxos uh, and Crete are the largest, and Cyprus are the largest islands, and I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it's, you know, it, we're dealing with this sampling issue where there's just not a lot of dirt left, and those islands have the higher probability of having dirt. So, um, yeah, that's, I wish I could say I knew of more stuff happening. Um, Nina Galanidou, who I mentioned, she's from the University of Crete, and she's been excavating on Lesvos at the site, Rodolf Nidia. That is an excellent project and an excellent site. It's, it's excavated really well. And the hand axes, if you wanted to find unambiguous hand axes, no, they don't look like it. They are hand axes. They're, they're just made on chert, and, they are, um, and they're made on volcanic materials as well. And they are uh, the best examples we have of Paleolithic tools in the Aegean. And so she's excavating there, so I'm excited to see what she's going to do. Um, but that's really all. Unfortunately, there's, not a, there's, there's a handful of Paleolithic archaeologists in the Greek islands. And I've mentioned them all tonight. So I, I, there's just so any students in the crowd, actually, if you're interested, there's a lot of room and there's a lot of work to be done. There's plenty of room in the Greek islands, and so you should definitely consider working there. And Salida is still ongoing, so send me an email if you're, you know, um, I'll, I'll I'll introduce you to Professor Carter, and maybe we can excavate with him. I know. I know, I know. Well, look, let me tell you this. Like, I know you, you, you love hominins. Everyone loves hominins. But let me, let me tell you this, because I, I wanted to fit the pl this plug in there anyway, so thank you for the opportunity. Professor Carter is currently giving a talk called um, The Origins of Human Seafaring and the Earliest Occupation of the uh, Aegean Islands. I believe that's what the title is. And if you just type in YouTube, Earliest um, Origins of Human Seafaring, um, you'll find his talk that it was recorded at the Canadian Institute in Greece. And I should have mentioned that um, the, the Salida Naxos Archaeological Project is a, is a, a synergia between the Canadian Institute and Greece as well. Um, and so, um, yeah, that, that talk, he goes into the, uh, which I didn't, I focused on the archaeology, he goes into the biological side, what species could have visited Naxos and had the potential capability. He, he'll brought it out to a global uh, scale, which is important because, you know, Crete is one of, of five islands that have Paleolithic um, archaeology that suggests for um, the potential for hominin seafaring. Um, there's multiple in the Indonesia, or not Indonesia, but the um, islands in the South Pacific, like Sulawesi. And, um, uh, yeah, so I would look at his talk. I generally do not speculate on hominins in the Aegean because I just don't think we can really nail it down yet. I think, you know, in our paper we say it's probably Neanderthals with our middle Paleolithic tools. Some people don't like that, but the reason why we say that is if you look at mainland Greece, all over Greece during the middle Paleolithic, Neanderthals were everywhere. So why wouldn't they be on Naxos? And at the end of the day, people will just say, well, we don't think Neanderthals could do that, cross open water. I just have to disagree. And that's it, right? Like, we have to agree to disagree. Some people think that only humans, Homo sapiens, could cross open water, be complex in cognition to do that. That's why Crete is so important, right? It forces us to kind of debate with not only what it means to be human, when it means to be human, and um, if Neanderthals, even though we know they had more symbolic, um, you know, uh, material record, we know they pierced shells and wore necklaces and potentially buried their dead, potentially had art, which is up for debate, but we know they were more complex than we previously thought. And is seafaring another line of evidence that Neanderthals were complex? Probably. And I think, actually, I do think in the next 10 years, the Aegean Basin, we're going to be able to answer that question a lot better. Because even though there's a few of us, we're working on it. And I just think that, really, it's only been really recently that we've just swallowed the idea that there's Paleolithic in the Aegean. And now we can get permits to look for it. We, can, we just needed the models um, to do this. My model, which is this geoarchaeological approach, is one of them, but there's another one. Uh, on Cyprus, there's a, another great archaeologist named Dora Mutsu, and she is working on developing GIS models for paleolith paleolithic site prediction, mainly on Cyprus, and she has a few papers out that I would also recommend looking into. So, I don't know, I can't tell you too much about hominins. I can just say that the idea is that Middle Paleolithic could be Neanderthals moving around the Aegean. The other reason, it's not just because 
Um, we don't know per se what hominins and what tools they used. It's not just because we don't like to make one-to-one -one correlations. It's also because that figure I showed you of how the past, the Aegean looks like from islands to a peninsula, that's a single paper and a single model based on four data points in the northern Aegean cores that are then extrapolated across the entire Aegean, which as I mentioned is one of the most actively tectonic regions in the world. So the model is great and it's a good starting point, but we cannot use it to make, um, to, as proof that people's crossed open water or didn't. We just can't yet. We need more paleogeographic data. We mean, need more geologists working on that. So it's kind of a, a dual problem we have where we have a coarse resolution on the past landscapes that existed and a coarse resolution, resolution on the actual archeology span that's there. So unfortunately, I wish I could make a bold statement and say, we know Neanderthals are seafaring, but I just don't think that we can. I think we have good evidence. We have evidence, we, we can say Middle Paleolithic tools are in the Aegean, whether or not it's Neanderthal seafaring, um, it could be uh, in our paper in Science Advances, we say that it's, you know, we can say that it's probably short island hopping. Um, but I can say that Crete demonstrates open water traveling by at least 100,000 years old. That's without a doubt. Um, whether or not it's humans or Neanderthals, we don't necessarily know. There's one more thing I'll say, and that is this is kind of a bomb that dropped in 2019, actually right after well, when our paper was being published or we would have mentioned it. Katarina Harvati re-looked at a key um, fossil from a site called Apodema Cave in the southern uh, peninsula of Greece in the Peloponnese. And forever it was thought that it was a, a Neanderthal, right? And the problem was the skull was kind of deformed. And so using really high-tech uh, scanning approaches, they reconstructed it and then did statistics on it and showed that it actually looks like it's human, homo sapiens. And so, and this skull dates to 200,000 years ago. And so if you have humans, which we traditionally think only made it up to around Israel, around 140, maybe 180,000 years ago, if they truly made it all the way to the southern peninsula of Greece, well, maybe there were humans around 200,000 years ago and in the proximity of the islands and maybe they could um, cross open water. Right. Well, not Homo sapiens, but they're humans. Okay. But they were. Uh, okay. You said Homo sapiens before. Okay. Well, you can think of them as Homo sapiens in a sense, but really it's, you know, you've got Denisovans, right? So Denisovans are a species that we've found in the Altai region of Russia. And um, they are around 40,000 years ago, like Neanderthals and humans. There's um, another species that is just called Luzonensis. It's found on the island of. of um, of Luzon in the um, Pacific Islands. Um, we have a, a, another one called Homo um, sediba, um, which was found in the southern um, coast of Africa. And that one, you know, that one looked like it was two million years old, but when they dated it, it was 250,000. Um, 250,000. Yeah. Right, anatomically, they thought it might be Australopithecus. And then when they dated the lava flow above it, it ended up being 250,000. So um, it's just gotten more crazy over the years as we keep making more discoveries. And so, um, you know, the idea is figuring out exactly which hominins, which means humans and related uh, species, were in the Greek islands is very difficult to do at the, at the time. But I think we're close. Oh, you're right, yeah. Um, is Ralph, like, the and yes. Like, yeah. Yeah, so what, 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 okay. So the question is what potential routes would hominins, whether humans or not, have entered into the Aegean Basin, right? Yes. Okay, so. Um, there's several, um, especially when you consider these kind of paleogeographic maps of a, of a land bridge. So traditionally the idea is they would have went around the Aegean through Thrace, so that's one. We know they did that. There's plenty of tools, uh, lower paleolithic tools up there. Um, there's two that would be um, across this kind of dual land bridge. You, if you looked at it at certain areas, there's a, there's a massive land bridge at some times in the glacial periods. And then other glacial periods you have a, a northern Aegean route and a southern route. 
And then another one would actually be, if you consider Crete, um, down south, the coast of Anatolia and Turkey, and then across Rhodes, Carpathos, um, and Crete, and up through that way. And so those, those would be the routes that we think. Oh, and then there's another one, which is our, our, um, honestly more controversial, but it is a North African kind of transoceanic across the Libyan Sea from North Africa to Crete or Cyprus. That's an open water route. So those are the routes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And I just want to make a, 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 a one statement. You were talking about a Professor Carter, Tristan Carter. And we are trying to bring him here. Uh, we've been trying for the last two years. He was coming twice, but uh, the pandemic stalled his arrival. So uh, I think tonight's lecture was a perfect a way to provide context for Professor Carter's presentation, which I hope will be in the next year or two. So uh, please stay tuned for an update on this type of work. Thank you.